Hello and welcome to the Sydney Film Festival. I'm Kelrick Martin. I am the head of the Indigenous Department of the ABC and also co-chair of the Screen Diversity and Inclusion Network. It's a very, very, very interesting session. We're going to be meeting the creators of Here Out West, the film's opening night film and an incredible anthology produced by Co-Curious and Emerald Pictures. However, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that no matter where we are joining from today, we are all on the traditional lands of Australia's First Nations people. I'd like to pay my respects to elders who are no longer with us, but whose legacy ensured that we continue to celebrate our culture and identity into the future. Our current leaders and elders who stand up strong for our mob every day, and those who are learning, listening, and growing into our leaders of the future. I'd also like to extend those respects to Indigenous uh, audience members uh, in attendance here today. Now, the last time I spoke to this team, uh, it was not a released film. The film hadn't been released. And I've got to say, there are a lot of relieved faces here in the uh, panel today. It's really great to see. Um, and look, we know that diversity is very, very hot at the moment. Um, and this project, I think, ticks so many best practice boxes. It's really, it's really, really wonderful. So look, congratulations, everybody. Um, I understand the film has done really, really well and received really well to date. Um, I've got to ask, how do you develop this idea from the beginning? This is a film that has so many voices, so many different cultural perspectives, creative perspectives. How do you keep them all aligned? How do you keep them all at the front? Maybe Sheila, you can tell us a little bit how we got started on this. Sure, um, great question. I think, um, look, we always had such faith in these wonderful writers that came together to tell this story. And that yes, there are eight different community groups um, amongst the writers and we've got nine languages in the film, but far from what makes, I guess, our team different, uh, we knew that ultimately with these writers, with their craft, with their skills and their passion, if you come back down to the truth of things, uh, we will be demonstrating how united and how much we all have in common, despite what we might look like or what languages we speak. So I think finding that universality in the story that I think would come from eight writers who have different experiences, but also shared experiences, having had a strong connection to Western Sydney, having a burning desire to tell a very specific story that was personal to them. We would land somewhere where we'd create a really unique feature film that was both highly uh, nuanced and different, but ultimately very life-affirming and universal. The, the film explores a bunch of, uh, uh, not a bunch, but it's like it explores many different perspectives from uh, communities and, and uh, individuals from uh, Western Sydney. How, how do you kind of move forward? Like, like, is each story developed individually? Are they developed together? Like, what's the writer's room look like on something like this? Is it crazy or like, I bet the food's really good? <laughs> writers, who'd like to take that? Matthias, do you want to kick off? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the process was so interesting. It was something I was um, new to um, in particular. And I think um, the process of the writer's room is we all kind of came together and did create a story that was um, unified first, first and foremost. And then uh, we were able to sort of break that into sections um, that we were able to sort of, um, I guess, go off and write our, our own parts um, and bring them back together and sort of find, like, once again, the unifying pieces. So that was sort of how it worked. Um, yeah. Right. Can, um, I, can I add something? Can yeah, I, Annabelle, please. Always, um, I've always been really um, fascinated about um, with, with this process was that, um, as, as Matthias said, um, we did spend that first day of the writer's room, or the writer spent um, that day really looking for um, a um, an incident, an underlying incident, which would connect these stories. What was really beautiful and maybe unexpected, maybe it was expected. I'd love to hear the, the writers on this. Was that um, thematically we didn't we didn't speak a lot about um, how they'd be unified thematically, and that just happened so organically and beautifully. Um, these these themes about family and, and belonging and identity. I think um, Bina might have said at some point in in one of the BTS clips that every story is about family and that happened without um without anyone sitting down and making a plan to do that that the, we, we focused I suppose on the on the plot structure and how the in, the underlying incident could bring the stories together but thematically um these themes emerged um, on their own 
perhaps one of the writers um, would like to, to talk further on that because I've heard I have heard you speak on it um, in our in our behind the scenes interviews. Um, Pina, did you want to jump in there? <laughs> um, so it was very interesting. We all got in the room together. We hadn't met each other. Um, I knew Vaughn. Um, you know, we'd uh, known each other from around the place, but I didn't know anybody else. Um, I was a bit nervous. And we had Blake in the room, who was a wonderful and very experienced script producer. And the intent was to have a series of chapters that were all very specific and that were our unique voices, but to have it all hang together really cohesively. Um, and that's a huge undertaking. I've said many times there are other anthology films about cities and all of them feel to me very disjointed. I feel like this film has done something really extraordinary, like globally to, um, and I say it's even more amazing because it's about Western Sydney, like not a glamorous place like Paris or New York it's a place that like is very misunderstood um and so you know we had this underlying incident which was of the abduction but each of us had ideas about what we wanted to say and I always you know talk about my experience like my dad was very ill at the time and he'd reverted to his native language which I don't speak as a mixed race person with a white mother um so you know I was I'm, I was bringing all of that into the room because I was you know doing dealing with all that kind of cultural baggage and um sadness and out of pure luck I had Arka in the room who I say you know, is a gorgeous actor who spoke Bengali what are the odds and we've never met each other and he was in the room and so my story would have always found a way but it's 10 zillion times better because it connected with Arka's story which was about a young man um and finding his sense of identity and and, and uh, being with his friends and you know his ambivalence about his own culture so I feel like the whole really is more than the sum of its parts so we had kind of an idea we each finessed something we brought it all back together and somehow we came up with something better than any one of our individual stories, which I just feel like is a really perfect reflection of Western Sydney because we always talk about community and most of us come from cultures that are very collective as well. Um, and I'm just going to shout to, to Claire because Claire has said a few times that being in a room full of creatives of colour, which was really new for all of us, emboldened Claire to pursue something with her story that she said she might not have done otherwise. And I feel like just that is why the film is as cohesive as it is. We sort of began to share a unified vision as the days went on. Um, and I think that's why the film is as good as it is. But yeah, there was no forcing it. There was no like, we're gonna do a thing about family. And I feel like that would come through in the final product if it had been heavy handed like that. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's such a light touch uh, that brings it all together. Um, so yeah, it was just the virtue of us all being in the room, meeting each other, having our own voice, but then also understanding that this thing was gonna be bigger than all of us. Look, I mean, I think that what it's really interesting what you guys are talking about, because I think that idea of um, family obviously comes through really strong. It's interesting when you talk about risk taking and sort of, you know, stepping outside what might seem to be a comfort zone with something like this. And I kind of just want to explore that a little bit, because I always feel like, particularly working in Indigenous spaces, this kind of sense of cultural responsibility and, you know, like, how do we represent um, everybody when everybody within our own communities is so diverse? And at what point do we start to um, step over that line of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable, what is our point of view and what is the point of view of the community. And I just wonder, um, did anyone have any aversion to that? Or like, um, at what point do you kind of go, okay, you know what, I think I can go there. Or do you have this kind of image of like an auntie hanging over your shoulder, an uncle, like sort of frowning upon the editorial decisions that you're making? Like, can, um, do you guys have any thoughts about how that, how you sort of take on that role and responsibility of representing effectively your community in a way. Hey, I'm wondering whether just given your story and what was at stake, you might want to take that one. Yeah, I'm, I've, uh, I struggle with this, with any projects I, you know, come across and this was my first um, to, yeah, to do this um, in the sense that I'm, I'm, I was presenting a, a uh, a culture, you know, um, and uh, a refugee family um, um, who, who've come to live to in Australia and and um, and going through all these challenges, um, not just through cultural identity, but also just trying to, um, you know, uh, do something that they love, you know, that they were doing back at home. So, um, yeah. So just um, it was very challenging in the sense that um, I had this responsibility of showing this culture um, in, a, in a way that doesn't offend them or, you know, uh, shows them in, in truthfulness. Um, so that, that was very challenging. Um, but 
it was always asking and always researching and always um, questioning um, the actors, you know, the, the community, um, the people I spoke to about this, um, that I felt safe to speak about this, um, this scene. Um, that's how I managed to um, work through this, you know, this chapter, so yeah. Anybody else with thoughts about this? Because I just think it's um, it's one of those things that we kind of really wear on our sleeve when we're kind of um, going into this space and representing who we are and who our community is. Um, uh, yeah, did anyone else have any thoughts about that uh, that experience? Yeah, so I, I wrote the first chapter and in it there's a little Lebanese girl, an eight-year-old girl called Amira. And I, I had thoughts throughout the whole process of, Am I representing the Lebanese community enough? I'm representing Amira as being a Catholic Lebanese girl, which I am, but what about the Islamic Lebanese community? Are they going to say, where's our representation? And I definitely did have that auntie voice there in the background. But I think ultimately, at the end of the day, when you know that a character sits very, very close to your heart and it's either a very researched character or a character that you have lived and you've experienced, you can only trust that that's going to be enough. And then really the responsibility falls on the audiences to when they're watching to kind of maybe take the writer's process into consideration and to not jump to conclusions as, as you know, um, that this writer is here trying to represent our whole community or whatever. At the end of the day for my chapter, um, I can speak for my chapter, it's a story about a little girl who happens to be Lebanese and her next door neighbor who happens to be an older white lady. That is at the basis of it is just a beautiful friendship between the two. Um, so I think if we all obviously acknowledge and notice the cultures, but if at the same time we can look beneath that and see the just the humanity underneath it, I think that's what makes the um, the experience for the viewers more enjoyable and richer. Mm. I think also it encourages all of us, um, especially when we were writing it, to be more specific and more local. Um, I mean, when I broke my story what, back in 2018, 2019, writing about a nurse, like my mom's a nurse. Um, yes, stereotype of a Filipino nurse, but you know, ever since I wrote this story, I've, been, I've had the pleasure to write for multiple Filipino characters. And I'm telling you, like, there are millions of stories within our own culture. And I think sometimes this, I think sometimes there's ideas, especially in Australia, that within a scarcity mindset that one cultural story has to tell all the stories, but you know, my mom is a woman of a billion lifetimes and, um, and there's so much more to learn from her and pull from her too. So I think, um, yeah, like Nizreen said, it kind of gave me license to be more specific with, with what I was writing, um, more specific about the characters and their own relationships and more specific about where I was writing it, basing it in a hospital in a certain area of, of Western Sydney. Um, and it just means that there, it, I hope it encourages more people to tell stories around that, if that makes sense, from, from my own culture too. I just wanna jump in because I like really agree with this, especially with my story. I think at times I didn't want to like have the specificity that it did because I was like, oh, like if it's in Mandarin, more people understand, like there's more Chinese people who understand it or like relate to it. Or like if I leave out like the Burmese part, but like, yeah, I think like the, the more specificity I included, the more it felt like these are complex human beings because like every person is like complex. And I think it is flattening to be like, they have to be represent, like everyone has to relate to this character or well, it's not really true. Cause I feel like what we relate to ultimately is like, you know, th that they feel like a human with experiences who has been influenced by like a multitude of things that isn't, that's not just like their cultural background or their race. So yeah, I think, I think like, yeah, growing up, my parents were born in Burma, but they're like ethnically Chinese. And because of that, I had such like a mixed cultural upbringing and my dad's Cantonese. And I didn't like necessarily relate to a character just because they were Chinese Australian, for example. So I think, yeah, when, when I think about how, why I relate to characters is because I'm invested in their relationships and their journey as people. And I think that's what the film really aimed to do. It wasn't just about like, you know, like even though culture is such an important part of like our lives, it's like one thing ultimately amongst like a you know multitude of things. Brilliant, brilliant. And I think that that, um, that, that representation of families you were saying, um, Vaughn, even in talking about the um, representing your mum, like did you, um, what did your mum think of the, the representation? Like did you tell her that it was based on her or obviously probably, she probably would have um, got it the minute she saw the character, but like, you know, <laughs> did, um, uh, did each of you sort of, 
borrow from real life and 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 um and how were the responses from those uh those borrowers or the, the borrowees i should say um uh to the film i assume it was warm maybe you might have got a clip over the year or something i don't know like i'll say quickly that my mom is always proud because she sees she sees herself in, in any character i write but uh she's furious that i named the character after her best friend <laughs> um she's always like why is it not my name and i'm like well mom you got me every mistake number one right there man yeah. it's really funny my sister gave me a hard time because she's like am i in your film like i i don't give you permission she's a lawyer i don't give you permission i i, I don't want to be in your film i'm like it is 100 a work of fiction it is about a woman dealing with an elderly Indian man, uh, a mixed race girl dealing with her elderly Indian father. Um, but don't worry, Rita, you're not in it. Uh, and then my mother is the same. She's like, uh, you know, cause they, they're nervous that it's gonna be an unflattering portrayal. And my my husband who has um, seen the film, he saw one of the early screeners with me, but he laughed so hard at the woman who played my, my like on screen mother. Like she's not really my mother, but it is a work of fiction. I have to say this for all of us. We are, we are drawing on our own experiences. It, they're close to our hearts, but a hundred percent, as soon as you start writing, it all becomes fiction. That's great line from a Todd Solon's film um, and I also say this like uh, Kelrick your thing about feeling the weight on our shoulders we all did because it's a huge responsibility but I always just tell myself if there were like 10 zillion films about mixed race Indian girls that came out in a year I wouldn't feel the pressure right if there were 10 Kurdish films that came out in a year if there were 10 Chilean films that came out every year from Australia we wouldn't feel that pressure we could just write characters and not have to feel so stressed about it um so yeah it was a huge undertaking but I think we all had faith that what we were telling was really important and you know like and what Miss Reen said is really true like you just have to find the truth of it like this was my experience you know this is a film that comes from me um and everything else you know I don't want to force anything else like every anything else is just posturing like this was just my truth and for all of us I think we all felt that way about our characters absolutely otherwise you kind of just drive yourself crazy right like you, you just got to kind of just get over it yeah um look I mean one of the things I really found beautiful about um this film was the the use of language you guys talked about specificity and how important that was but um but I just I just really appreciated the use of of language within this film and I just wonder the process of doing that the collaboration that was required and the consultation and the and the you know the determination to kind of get that right like what was what was the um what was the importance or the the, the value that you guys put into doing that um uh creatively to make sure that that was representative of, of, of the culture and the, and the authenticity of that particular point of view Matthias, I, I know you had a bit of experience in in like yeah. translations and things like that right like trying to get yeah. that right? Yeah, I can speak a bit about my my own because uh, I'd say probably about eighty percent of my section is in language, um, and for me, it actually wasn't um, so much a, a problem. It was something that actually came really naturally because because uh, I, I speak the language. Like actually writing the script in Spanish felt way more natural as well. <laughs> um, so that was a really nice process. Um, I think it got tricky when we were sort of juggling the. English script with the Spanish script and all the amendments and you're trying to keep up to date but um no it, it was really great and um to be able to write in language and um write something like the poem for example first and foremost I wrote that in Spanish and translated it to English um that was that was really great and then um later on in the process you know um I you know things like just checking in with my, my parents and just being like do I get this translation right like does this make sense and just uh, double checking things because um, uh, some things can always um, get stuck. But it was it was quite funny, you know, um, speaking to to my mom about like there was one line in particular in the film that was super Chilean, like a, just a super Chilean saying. And um, my mom was like hesitant to say that that was the correct way to 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 say. Um, there's a line where he says um, he's not a little kid anymore, and he just they just say it in a really Chilean way. And my mom was like, oh, but that's so chilly. And no, you should say it like this. And I was like, but mom, that's how we talk. Like, and she kept wanting to tell me that um, it was too colloquial. Like, uh, and, um, but I think that's through that specificity, we were able to make it a little bit um, more personal as well and just realistic. Um, so <laughs> I had to keep her at bay a little bit with, with <laughs> the translations, not to become too proper Spanish um, and still keep it colloquial. But um, yeah, it was a great experience. Brilliant. Um, I just wonder, uh, 
uh, Sheila, and uh, if I can come back to you for a moment, I mean, the the way you guys went about this, I said at the beginning, there's, there's so many best practice boxes that were ticked on this one. And I just wonder, um, as you kind of went forward with the production, uh, how do you ensure that those things are, are being done? Like, because uh, there's no... There's no rule books, no templates, no no guidelines for this sort of stuff. Um, particularly now that you know diverse stories are becoming more popular, more frequent now within Australia, which is fantastic. Like, like how do you develop that stuff, and what do you develop in order to help not just the the creatives that are working on the film, but also the crew who maybe aren't familiar with with those cultural practices or those points of view, and and maybe need to be understanding before they even get on set, like things like that. It's a huge question and so important. I think, sure, we started off with a very um, strong base and that the mission was always um, to make sure that the writers were front and centre, it was their stories. But I won't say that we got it right the entire way. I think this area, everyone has to be so open to learning and if you make a mistake, to have the conversations and to grow from that. So I think that I think that's so important. There's no, There is no rule book per se that I know of when it comes to a creative process when you're bringing together 100 people to make a film like things can go wrong but I guess you know having at the heart of it that we had to have open conversations with all the hods coming into it that this is a different model yes you might make films a certain way where there's hierarchies in place we're, we're going to try and shift that here because there's a much bigger purpose at play and it's it, it'll it'll and it's not just because there's a bigger purpose we actually truly believed that by involving the writers um, in a as meaningful way and as collaborative way as possible, we get a stronger result. And, I, and I'm hoping that sort of shows on the screen. So uh, by and large, there was a great um, desire to come along that journey. Of course, there's moments where people are like, well, that's not how we normally do things. But I would say um, everybody welcomed that. And, you know, I had feedback from Hods who said it was the most enriching experience working on the film to be able to have that access to the writers, to have their pitch docs we had them do these wonderful research packets where they got to put up what their vision the tone the influences casting choices locations that had influenced them all of that was all around our production office and the number of times that i'd see people just standing and staring and reading them so um yeah um i don't know if anyone else wants to jump in on that maybe julie just given that it was it's different i suppose uh, yeah, well, it was a different experience um, coming in and and directing one of the chapters. And when Annabelle approached me to um, come onto the project, it was really clear from the start what the project was. It was really clear that the writers were part of the process, that they were associate producers on, on the project and that the writers would be on set. Um, and so it was really good to know that up front. And it was really good to have, you know, to have Vaughn, because uh, I directed Vaughn's chapter, to have Vaughn... Um, on set and to have him as a resource because it's about a, a Filipino um, family. It's about a group of Filipino nurses and that's not my culture. I, I connected with aspects of the story, which you know every director needs to do. And I grew up in Western Sydney, but the actual specificity of that story, I could then go to Vaughn um, and talk to him about and talk to the actors about. And it just became, it just became an, an an added bonus and an extra resource. And I think as a director, when you have those things at your disposal, you'd be silly to fight against that or, or not use them because it does make the story richer in the end. Brilliant. Yeah, I think, I think a key word there is resource. Um, one thing I really have always loved about this project is that the producers um, have always adopted, you know, such an inclusive lens from the beginning, but really have taken the time to, to divide the resources up two practices that might not be standard. Um, you know, to go back to the translation question, I don't speak fluent Tagalog. I can't write fluent Tagalog. So, you know, in talking to the producers, it was like, okay, well, I would love a translator to work with in order to break the story. And then what's the fluency of the cast members that were auditioning? Like questions like this do take up so much time. Um, and it was beautiful to, you know, when Julie came on board to collaborate with all of us as a team, but to really give these conversations time to grow naturally as well. So we weren't cutting corners. We were saying, hey, I think we need to slow this down a bit. There's a conversation that needs to be had here. And always fostering that um, inclusivity was, was so important to the, to the project. 
And I was really lucky I had Arka on set. Arka, I want to throw to you because you did so much in terms of the Bengali language stuff in my film as well and in your own film. So, Yeah, um, thanks, Brina. I mean, I can say that language was very important to, um, you know, um, get right in this film, obviously. I have my mum actually, <laughs> it plays my mum in the film, which is hilarious, but she is just on the phone. Um, but, you know, we had that, that sort of... Um, we had to get that right too, because, you know, what's, what's really interesting is Leah Purcell directed my, my chapter and, you know, she's indigenous. And one of the first chats that I had with Leah was about connecting to the story rather than connecting to the culture. Like, I don't think she went off and said, Oh, I'm going to need to like find out all this stuff about Bengali culture and like blah, 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 you know, to, to sort of connect to it. I think she just, you know, that as a director, she connected to growing up in the burbs, growing up in the on the block where the three boys sort of grow up, um, and she connected to having brothers. Um, so I thought that was really fascinating and a brilliant sort of you know moment for um, collaboration between an indigenous um, artist and a, an artist of color like myself, growing up in Australia. Both of us, you know, being united by like yeah the geography of Australia I guess um so I think like yeah the language was really important um I think my dad helped a lot with the Bengali in Bina's chapter um there's a song in the chapter which is an old song and it was about getting that right and the translation of that song and what it means and the actress Leah Vandenberg singing that song who isn't Bengali she had to learn it herself so there were you know there's a lot of tricky things there you have to get right um, I actually worked with two directors essentially and with Anna Kokonos and Leah Purcell um, trying to get both of them <laughs> both of the chapters sort of you know the authenticity of both of the chapters right and the Bengali that goes through both the chapters look I, it's not an easy feat and I think that having multiple chapters having multiple directors um, and um, you know a tricky language film it, it's, it's a challenge, but I think that we, I would safely say we actually did knocked it out of the park and that's thanks to the producers overseeing the process and also everyone just being open to, to, to collaboration, as Julie said, because I think if you came into a project like this and you weren't open to collaboration and you weren't open to like listening um, and using the writers as resources and you just wanted to kind of be headstrong about what you were going to do, I don't think it would work. So, you know, that's, that's yeah, kudos to everyone. Who came on and you know collaborated. I hope there are producers watching this panel just making furious notes about um, how best to work with uh, these types of subjects. Um, one of the thing, one, another thing I kind of want to ask about is is casting. You guys have mentioned a little bit about casting and and some of the complexities and challenges you guys had. Um, you know, I mean, we always hear stories about uh, the industry bemoaning you know, they want to put more diverse faces on but they can't find them or they, you know there's no one out there i mean what were your own challenges uh on the film in in casting and uh how did you kind of overcome those sure um well we had our casting director have a meeting with each of the writers so they were actually the writers were the first people that the casting director spoke to which i think was absolutely not a story. Sorry, there's a bit of a buzz there. Um, and a casting director I've worked with, Alison Meadows, who's done so many um, diverse projects and who is willing to go that extra mile deep into communities. It's not a case of, well, we can't find anybody. They're out there. We've just got to find them. So having that mentality that um, the talent is out there, um, uh, we've just got to work hard to find them. And again, going back to the writers, um, I don't know, maybe Tien, do you want to talk about your, I love the cast in Brother Tom with um, Brandon and, and Koi and just the importance of getting that cast right and what they had to, I suppose, bring to it in terms of the accents and the language. Maybe you might want to. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, because for for Koi's character, um, well, I, I guess the character of Brother Tom, um, he needed to put on so many different accents. He had to put on like the, the Western Sydney accent and then, and then like the Eastern suburbs corporate kind of accent you get in the CBD because he's a corporate worker. And then he gets home and he has to put on, he has to speak in Vietnamese, but he has to speak in a uh, Southern Vietnamese accent because, you know, there's like three uh, main accents in, in Vietnam. There's like Southern, Northern and Central. And um, so getting the casting agent to find someone that fit all those criteria, uh, I mean, you know, they, they somehow made it work, but it wasn't, you know, they, 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 it wasn't going to be easy for them. And, and also the character of Brendan, like, because I, I also told him, like, you know, this, I, I don't know how easy it is to, to, uh, to find someone to, uh, to play the character of uh, Tom's brother, but 
you don't have to look for people in um, from acting schools. You can look for just normal people, just uh, everyday people on the street. And that's what they did. They actually went to Cabramatta and just went around to all the businesses, put flyers around and just said, hey, do you want to act? And they just, the lady told me she actually approached people on the street and just gave them flyers. And said, hey, come, come in and an audition for this movie. Um, yeah, that, that was pretty much the, the process. And I would assume for um, the actors probably were, were, was a bit of a, um, a strategy for a lot of um, a lot of the casting, yeah, possibly. Um, I'll just jump in and say, I mean, for, for my chapter, I, I got approached by Alison Meadows, who I know very well through sort of my acting work, um, you know, whether it was going to, we wanted to go to street casting or not. And I just will say that for me, I actually told them not to. Um, and the reason being is that I've, as an actor in this country um, being a colored actor in this country for over 10 years now i feel like there's plenty of talent in the country that can actually do the job um and you know there's so many actors that miss out on amazing opportunities and roles every day because there aren't these kind of specific roles for them you know they, they don't come up they don't come up much because you know their people are not writing them enough, i guess um and, and the industry isn't fostering it enough but i mean now i think things are changing and people are fostering them but i think you know traditionally it wasn't the case so i in my head knew who i kind of wanted to play like the role of rashid for example in my chapter which is played by rahel Rahman, who's a good friend of mine but i also just thought he was just perfect for it from the beginning um he's from western sydney there was three dialects in my film too um you know um like tn's like they have to speak in a western sydney dialect have to get that right that was really important um because the worst thing you can do is have a fake western sydney dialect um and Secondarily, you know, they speak to other people in the film. So that in the chapter, sorry. So they have to get that kind of accent. And then it's like when Robbie speaks to his mom on the phone, he's got a completely different sort of demeanor and accent. So I knew that there were capable actors in Australia and in Sydney and New South Wales that could that could do the job. Um, obviously, sometimes there's limitations with actors. They're doing other work. They're not available. You know, blah, blah, blah. You can't get this person, that person. But I, I just, Alison knew that as well. And she, she went and got the right people. And we did chemistry sessions in the room with Tuso who ended up playing Dino's character and he was perfect for it in the end and Leah being an actress herself Leah Purcell knew where to look you know and how to look for them for actors and I think yeah I mean you can go to the street and or you can you can find them it's just about authenticity I think and and sort of nailing the nuances of the characters and that's the most important thing. Just on the topic of um of the nuances and stuff so casting my like the eight-year-old Amira we needed a girl who was Lebanese, but who could speak fluent Arabic, but not just a general fluent Arabic and Arabic from the North. And so we had a lot of girls come in who spoke very, very good Arabic, but they sounded like they were from the South of Lebanon. And so there was a part of me that was going like, oh, it doesn't matter. Just an Arabic accent is an Arabic ac accent. It doesn't matter. And I'm like, no, this other voice on this side was like, no, it does matter. You are from the North. I want to tell a story about a little girl. Her parents come from the mountains, the mountain villages. And if the casting process is, you know, takes a little more time, it doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, if the resources are there and we can find ultimately a girl who is you when you were eight years old, then why not dedicate resources to doing that? Um, and then we ended up getting um, Mia Law, who was just like gorgeous. So, yeah, so I think that nuance is super, super important. I want to I ask one more question because we're nearly uh, at the end of our um, session today. But... Um, something that I think is kind of interesting uh, when you are um, representing a particular culture or, or a particular point of view, um, and that is this kind of notion of kind of pigeonholing, particularly when it comes to your next steps in your career. Like you do a story, you tell your own story, you tell a diverse story, and then it's kind of like, is, does that kind of box you in that for the rest of your career? Or what's, it's that kind of like question of, is that where you're comfortable or do you want to break out? Like, for all of the writers, I would just ask, like, how, how do you look to your future now? And is that something that concerns you or you embrace or, or you're quite comfortable with, or, you know, in, especially here in Australia? I'll talk a little I mean, bit. Oh, sorry. No, you go. No, I, well, I, I would just say that, like, yes, there's, the, like, in terms of the film, the cultural aspects are obviously important, but the craftsmanship is also there, too. So... Um, you know, having Blake in the room and having trained us up essentially within writers' rooms, um, it kind of does give us a lot of the experience to go forward in our writers' careers as well. Obviously, I think it's a question for the market. You know, um, I'm lucky enough to have, you know, literary representation. And yes, 
some of the projects that come on my desk have Filipino characters, but, um, and it just depends on the market creating that demand, I think. Um, do I wanna write Filipino characters my whole life? No, I, and, I, and I equally have success writing White, white characters, if I if I can say that. So, so um yeah, I think the pigeonholing is interesting, but I think um I mean a lot of us here are also hyphenates, like director, writers, or writer producers. So I think it's also empowering us to kind of create our own stories as well. Um, yeah. Lena, you were gonna say. Oh, well, I've written a lot of scripts. Um, I, I write a lot and most of them have really huge scope and they're set in far flung places. But it was really interesting after Here Out West and with COVID in particular, uh, my first kind of feature project that I was going to do, which was a horror movie and it was set in India and I had a great producer attached. It was never going to happen after COVID. Um, but I kind of wrote something in my own backyard and I think I was emboldened. And I noticed when I was writing it, how much better my big print was and like that that came from working on this film. Um, but my big thing, honestly, like Here Out West is very... Indian because it's about reverence for parents it's about culture it's about embracing your culture these are things that Indians like I find the community really love like they, they're going to be very resonant and a lot of you know migrant communities are really going to relate I'm more concerned because my next film has like lots of sex and is kind of really risque and I'm just kind of feeling like some, some really nice Indian person will tap me on the shoulder and be like oh what's your next project and I'm like don't know if you're gonna like it because it's like very R-rated so that's kind of my bigger thing that's the bigger issue but like I think I have more of an audience like I say this all the time there's a billion Indians there's 300 million Bengalis and there's countless other mixed race people all over the world. I will always be able to find an audience for my work. Always. There's nothing niche about any of us, actually. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and just on, on that, being I, I, I don't mind being pigeonholed into writing these kind of stories because there's so many uh, stories left to write. So even if I am pigeonholed into writing only these stories, not everyone can like bring it to life anyways. It takes a lot of effort. Like what these guys did, you know, putting in, uh, getting translators, putting extra time to shoot extra scenes, extra cuts to get everything right, the cultural specificity of, of it all. I, I don't mind being pigeonholed because I know not every production company is going to be able to put in that effort to, to bring this to life, you know? So, yeah, like, it still, it takes a lot of work. Um, yeah. Well, um, I'll, I'll just jump in and say, oh, yeah. That, yeah, I don't, I, I echo Tien, I think, and, 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 and Bino as well, in saying that there's nothing bad about cultural specific, culturally specific stories. Like there's this weird kind of fear of like people writing, you know, stories of their own culture. And then it's like, oh, you know, am I, you know, I just don't get why that's looked at as a bad lens. I mean, I never really quite understood that. I think it's because it, stories have always been so homogenous um in in you know in our um especially in the australian industry i, I can say and and in you know around the world um so that when say like an african-american person writes an african-american story um people go oh amazing you know but then it's kind of like <laughs> you can you can judge the story on the craftsmanship and you know whether you don't have to love it just because it's culturally specific to someone you can also hate that film or that story but i just think i just think we need to just you know um, broaden the lens in, in Australia and just, you know, uh, I don't, I don't want to particularly write South Asian characters for the rest of my life, but I want to write more South Asian characters because they're fascinating to me and, you know, and they're in, they're deep and layered and complex. And so are other cultures from other, you know, uh, characters from other cultural backgrounds. So I think we just need to let go of that, um, idea in Australia of like, you know, being in your little lane and kind of writing in your little lane or being, you know, producing things that are in your little lane. I think, I think we need to open up. And I think if we do open up more, we'll, we'll be able to, you know, compete more on a global scale and, and be, be sort of taken <laughs> much more seriously around the world. Not that we are taken seriously, but I just mean, you know, be, yeah, be a little bit more, I don't know, globally richer or something. Good point, Arka. Thanks so much, mate. Really appreciate it. And to all of you, thank you so much for your time today, joining us on the panel. Um, really fascinating insights. Congratulations again on the film and absolutely sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for what's coming up next from you guys. So again, thank you very much. Have a good one and it's great to chat. Thank you. Thanks, Kelrick.